This week, I sit down with Brett McComas, and we talk live bait versus plastics, eel pout fishing, hooking live minnows, and line choice for walleyes. Welcome to this week's episode of Ask the Buzz, the show where you send us your fishing questions and we answer them. I'm Nick Linder, and this week I have with me Brett McComas from Target Walleye. Hey Nick. How's it been rolling? Awesome, life is good. Have you been out fishing lately? More than I should admit, but uh, yeah, the bite's been good around here and it's kind of hard to get work done, but, but yeah, it's been awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, I actually just the other night hit the ice with Brett for a little burbot excursion, and we will get into more burbot things later. But for now, for question number one, I want to start out with a little bit more panfish walleye, live bait, plastic, etc. Um, George Petro sent out a question, and he asked, is live bait always better than spoons or plastics for panfish and walleyes? That is a good question. I like how it's, uh, is it always better? Like it's not even a question. But, but it's a lot, it's a live minnow. It's a live, right. you know. Um, so I'm kind of an exception to that. I like to fight for the, the idea that artificials are always better than live bait, which I know doesn't really make sense because, uh, you know, they're trying to mimic live bait. So how can it be better? But a couple examples of that, like, did he say panfish? Yeah. So panfish, when you're on a hot bite, they come through in schools and pods. It's not usually just one roamer. If you're using live bait and you catch a fish and there's four more down there on your graph, you got to take the fish off, rebait the hook. By the time you drop back down, those fish are probably gone. When I'm using uh, artificials, plastics on my jigs instead of live bait, I feel I can pull an extra couple fish out of every pod that comes through just because I can pop the hook off, get back down there and catch one real quick and you don't have to fumble. No taking your gloves off to rebait because who can put a, a Euro larva on with gloves on, you know, but sure. no, I'm 100% I'm for the artificial movement. <laughs> Same with walleyes. I mean, there's exceptions, um, you know, rattle reels and tip ups and set mm -hmm. lines where, yeah, you need to have live bait because you need that movement down there. but for the most part, you know, ripping wraps, jigging wraps, aggressive things to call fish in. You know, even some of the jigging spoons, like this buckshot here, I'll put on a VMC glow resin treble. And then even if your minnow head falls off and I've dropped it down without a minnow head on it, they'll still bite that because there's still something for them to kind of hone in on and, and aim at. But sure. Now I think uh, you're going to see a lot more, a lot more artificials in the future and people are starting to kind of jump on board so so i'm with you there i mean for me i feel like if you can use artificials you always do it so like i was out you know like a month ago or whatever catching bluegills and during the prime time window when they were really biting i had like a little mustache worm on and mm -hmm. a lot of the people around me were fishing wax worms or whatever and i was able to catch like two fish for every one yep. you know while the bite was going but when it slowed down they were maybe out catching me. Is right. there, are there, so you love artificials. When would you maybe go to meet? You know, for panfish, I really don't. I, I haven't bought any euros or wax worms in probably four seasons, three seasons now. Um, you know, there are times where the guy that's got three euro larvas on his jig, like you said, in a fussy bite, might have the, the up on you, but I don't think there's a need for them, honestly. Okay. Right on. I'm going straight plastics. I can dig it. I can dig it. Now, we're going to jump into question number two. And I think this is the subject that both of us are probably most excited for. Oh. And that is pout. Jackpot. <laughs> so Bring question number two is from DJ Olson. And DJ says, it seems like eel pout have really been growing in popularity in recent years. For someone like me who's never targeted them, how do I start? Location, presentation, best time of year, et cetera. Sure, that's an awesome question. Um, I happen to be wearing my burbot uniform today, <laughs> kind of like the Northern Minnesota. You gotta have a lucky burbot hat that's got the <laughs> flaps for the ears and flannel, but uh, 
No, in all seriousness, my hands down my favorite fish to fish through the ice now. The fight is incredible. Um, DJ Olson. So what you got to look for in a lake is first it's got to have yield pout. Um, big, deep, cold water lakes, especially if they're connected to some sort of a river system, have an inlet and an outlet, but most importantly is cold water, deep and clear, um, are going to be your best bet to find eel pout. You're not going to necessarily be able to look at like the DNR survey data and see. Um, we were just talking about this the other day. I think the DNR had netted 15 or 20 eel pout in their traps and nets over the last mm -hmm. year in the whole state. So they're not going to show up in the data because they're going to be belly to the bottom in the deepest hole in the lake. Um, you kind of just got to go out and put in the work to see if the lake has them, go off of rumors. Usually you hear the old guys complaining in the bait shop that they had to cut their line. <laughs> uh, you know, the guys are out there walleye fishing and as soon as they caught an eel pout, then they head home. Um, you hear rumors like that and that's a lake you got to go search for. Um, as far as where to start looking, you know, it is a night bite. Um, they like to be in areas where that they have access to that super deep water, uh, you know, the deepest holes in the lake. What, is, uh, what does night bite mean? Okay, so the best bite for them is going to be after dark, after hours. You can, you know, it's a working man's fish. You can get off work at 5 o'clock, go home, have supper, and um, then head to the yeah. lake, and you still haven't missed the prime bite because the bite usually starts kind of a half hour after sunset or sunset okay. and we'll go all night now you're gonna have waves of fish come through um, usually that first wave is gonna be a heavy push of fish say the first hour and a half or two hours after dark um, but you'll steady catch them all night where you might not have another bite until 11 o'clock or midnight but then there's a wave that comes through and you catch a bunch like that um, mm. so that is one cool thing is you, you know it's frustrating when you hear the hot crappie bite is at two o'clock or three o'clock. Well, don't these people have jobs, you know? <laughs> it's like, so that's one of, the, one of the cool things about eel pout. Um, so I look for those deep holes and that's where they're gonna be the majority of the year and during the daytime. Um, but as the sun's going down, those fish will slide up from those deep holes to the bottoms of the breaks. Um, so like, let's say off of a large flat, it drops from 12 feet down to 30 and there's going to be the bottom of that break before it tapers off into the basin. Those fish will make a push at sunset to that first break. And that's usually where I key in on for the first couple hours of the evening. And then as those fish kind of disappear, you'll slide on top of that hump. Um, gravel, rocks is best because eel pot will spawn there and they actually spawn under the ice. So mid-February, end of February into March is prime eel pot fishing and you just kind of follow them up from that deeper hole. And as the night progresses, slide up into that shallow water until you're in the 12 to 16 foot deal on top. And I like to focus on the edge of that flat. So let's say it's 10 feet deep on top, fish that very upper lip before it breaks down when it's sure. the middle of the night bite. Um, you know, it's just better percentages versus fishing right on that break. You know, it's tough to to cross paths with them then if they're sliding up and down and you're somewhere in the middle. But yeah, no, they're a blast. Uh, Good deal. What, you, what you catch them on. So you can catch them on walleye, walleye gear and that's usually how most good eel pout spots are found. It's by the guys that are out there walleye fishing and towards the end of the night they think they're hooked up with about a 24 inch walleye and it's a four pound eel pout because they fight so hard. But What a treat. Yeah, I mean you can catch them <laughs> right on, on your, your standard um, you know, buck shots and, and jigging spoons for walleye. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go out and specifically target eel pout, the bigger, the heavier, and the brighter, the better. Um, you know, I use jigs that are 5 eighths ounce all the way up to even an ounce and a half, um, depending how deep I'm fishing. But what's key is pounding that big heavy jig into the bottom so that you're stirring the muck up, stirring stuff up, and they're nosy, they'll be right in there to come look for it. Um, and the brighter the better, you know, you want to glow your jig, say every 10 minutes, um, you know, to keep yeah. it bright, keep making noise, making vibrations to right. call them in. And uh, as far as tipping these things, it's going to sound gross, but two, three, four minnows, as many as you can pack on there and still see the tips of the hooks. Um, I like to use shiner just because they're about the stinkiest thing out there. Rip them in half and I'll put two heads and two bodies on 
on one jig and spoon and you know it it's kind of the ugliest setup you could probably fish with but well, they catch the prettiest fish it's so. <laughs> the prettiest fish <laughs> i love it i agree i agree yeah i mean th this is basically a big giant glow machine built to glow and pound the bottom i yep. mean how heavy is this that one's an ounce and five eighths it's a big boy so that, that's a big boy i'll use that <laughs> if i'm in say 40 feet of water or so um, the 5 eighths ounce size is awesome for anything else. It's like the 10 out to 30-ish. Right. Um, that's kind of the universal size. But, uh, you know, you can catch them on your standard walleye spoons, but heavier is better just because if you have too much flutter, you're not going to be able to hit bottom and really kick up the junk, you know, and which just helps to call fish in. Sure. Um, another thing that I'll use is actually this old school just a regular jig head, a three quarter ounce or one ounce glow jig head. And the reason for this with a single hook is if you get on a, a hot burbot bite, they come through in waves like we said. So you might go a half hour or an hour without a bite and you catch or hook into one fish, you'll see that there's two or three others on the graph on the bottom a lot of the times. And the downfall of using a jig and spoon is with the treble hook, it's just, it takes you that much longer to find pliers and get those hooks out because when they get the bait, they have it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you're not usually on the outside or on the, you know, they engulf it. So switching over, having another rod rigged up with uh, the single hook just lets you pop that fish off that much quicker and drop back down and hope that you can pluck another one out of that pod. It's sort of like the same uh, idea or benefit as like using artificial. Yeah. You can get back down to the... <laughs> Well, while it's rolling yep. in the hot feeding window. It's all about taking advantage of it as they come through. And, you know, if it, if it means that you can get one extra fish out of that pod and you catch one more than your buddy, then yeah, that's what go. I'm all about. Sure. You know, it's always out fishing the guy next to you, right? What's a, what's a good night of burbot fishing? It depends on the lake. Um, you know, some of the lakes around Brainerd, a good night might only be three fish, four fish, five fish. Um, there are some lakes farther north where you're gonna get 20 or 30 or 40. And then, you know, as the season progresses, it gets better and better. So like on a local Brainerd Lake, let's say a good night is three or four. If you hit that big window where those fish, like let's say first week in March or end of February are sliding up to spawn and you hit that perfect feeding window, you could catch 20 or 30 of them in a 45 minute window or an hour with you and another guy. Right. So it, it is kind of like trophy hunting. Um, you know, there's a lot of lakes that don't have a big population, and if you catch three, it's a great night, and the fight's worth it. I mean, you hook into a, a seven-pound eel pout, and you'd swear you have a 28-inch walleye or 27-inch walleye. It's just, it, they throw it's you long. around, and it's, it's kind of like deer hunt, and I would sit there all night just to hook up with one big one. I mean, it's nothing like it. I'm with you there. Um, so, that, I mean, that, that's basically a little mini burbot master class <laughs> from Brett. Um, but we're going to move off the burbots now. Fine. Go to a little bit more of a traditional, a traditional species here. Or I guess this one, this one isn't even a species specific question, but uh, Richard Bailey asks, what is the best way to hook a live minnow? Through the eye, through the middle of the back, through the tail? What do you tend to do? Sure. Uh, there's kind of two, three things that I do. If you're using a jig and spoon, and this probably isn't what he's talking about, but a jig and spoon, you're gonna use just a minnow head, hook them right through the lips, um, just for that extra scent on there. But I'm assuming he's talking more like bobber fishing, set lines, rattle reels. Um, you know, it's kind of personal preference, but what I do and what I feel gets me more bites is I'm gonna skin hook them right in front of the dorsal fin. And I'm talking the tip of that hook goes through so thin that you can actually see it through their skin. And the reason I do that is that minnow is gonna sit there perfectly level like that so it looks natural and that thing will stay alive all night. We've put them down on rattle reels where we actually sleep out in the fish house. And if it didn't get bit in the morning, you pull it up and that minnow is still sitting there kicking. If you hook them you know, too deep, you're gonna, it's just gonna hurt them. But just skin hook in, they'll sit there and swim. And the reason that I do the hook facing forward like that instead of say sideways like you see some guys is fish naturally engulf minnows head first even when they come yeah. up from the side if you watch in aqua view slow motion hits there's lots of videos out there like that that are addicting to watch you'll see <laughs> they open their mouth and suck it in and the head slides in first well if that hook is like that 
you're already lined up exactly how you want to be for setting that. You know, it's just something that helps up your odds. Um, so I'm going to skin hook through the back. The only other thing that I really do for set lines, if it's an aggressive bite and the fish are really chasing, I will sometimes tail hook them just to let them swim. Um, you know, you think you've got that pivot point with a sinker, that'll let that minnow swim out, you know, 10, 12 inches to the side and back. Um, same idea, but a lot of times you don't want them to be able to move that freely because if walleyes are a lot of times fussy, let's face it. And if that minnow's too aggressive and swimming away, they might not chase it. Mm -hmm. So you want them kind of staying in that same general area, you know, and you can sure. adjust that by sliding the sinker for how much breathing room that they have. But skin hook through the back, you won't regret it. <laughs> what about any situation where you're putting them through, through the snoot? Pretty much the only time I do that is jigging spoons. If you're jigging, um, you know, even on a bobber rod, if you're gonna be jigging that bait, you don't really want to skin hook just because you're going to lose way more minnows. You're going to rip them off. That's more of a letting them sit down there and work themselves. But yeah, I will hook them usually just through the lips and out the top of the head or in the mouth and out the top of the head when I'm using a jigging spoon. Um, typically, I'm pinching off the lower half and just using a head, but sometimes okay. I'll leave a whole minnow on. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's a, such an extremely popular question that yeah. we get is like hooking minnows and it, there doesn't seem to be a consensus but I mean that's that's got to be you know the best way to do it one of the best ways to do it yeah I'm, I'm with you there works for me if I'm using minnows remember artificials right but rattle right. reels set lines tip ups dead sticks I get there is a need for for live bait especially sure. walleyes for yeah minnows, right so. definitely well I know we're probably running a little bit long but I, I want to get this last question in because this is also another very popular question. Sure. Um, and it is regarding line choice. And a lot of people always have questions about line. Um, and this question is from Eldon Holmes. And he asks, what's the preferred line strength for walleyes? Can you use heavier line like 10 pound or 12 pound if you're using fluorocarbon? Sure. Uh, ice fish and walleyes. You know, it, it is an open-ended question because there's so many technique specifics where you might have mono or lighter lines for different, you know, different things where it works better. But uh, a couple examples, so like rattle reels, set lines, since we were just talking about that, I love heavier fluorocarbon. Um, you know, like that 10 pound, 12 pound even, it sounds heavy. But what I like about that is when you get a fish in the hole, you don't have to be worried about grabbing the line to help turn the head up the hole. You know, if you're using that six or seven or eight pound test, you could break off by doing that. So if I'm using set lines, rattle reels, whatnot, 10, 12, I have even done 14 pound fluorocarbon, works great uh, and it sinks. So it's, right. it's nice for resetting the bait. It gets down there real quick. Fishability. Um, the majority of the time, if I'm using you know, jigging spoons and stuff like that, I would go a little bit lighter, um, six to eight pound test. It's nice that Suffix actually sells a seven pound. So if you're indecisive sure, like me sure. and you're like, oh, I In want between. each one, seven pounds a nice compromise, but you get a little better action out of your jigging spoons with a lighter line too. If you have too heavy of a line and especially with fluorocarbon that sinks, you're not gonna get the same flutter of certain baits. It's gonna kind of drown them out and it's gonna be more just flat. Um, so better action, definitely more bites on lighter fluorocarbon if you're in clear water. Um, you know, even with braided line, if I'm using a leader, um, you know, just lighter line, you're gonna get more bites, but if the water's dirty or, you know, you're doing something like a rip and wrap, bigger, aggressive, yeah. you're not worried about a fish seeing the line. It's all a reaction bite. So you can definitely get by with 10 pound then. Are you always, uh, so, if you're going out onto a lake, is there a general uh, rule of thumb or way you're trying to start? Like, do you, do you, are you trying to catch them heavy in the beginning or do you start out light and move up if you're not having any issues or what's your approach? Yeah, I start in the middle, eight pound, seven or eight pound. You can pretty much do anything with it. But yeah, if you find out it's a super light bite, go lighter, go more finesse. You know, if it's aggressive, you can upsize, but something like seven or eight pound, you could get by with basically any lake. Sure. 
any right situation. On. So cool. Well, I appreciate the help here and <laughs> answering these questions. Anytime. I appreciate you coming on. Let's go catch some bourbon again. Absolutely, absolutely. Is there uh, before we go out and catch some bourbon? Is there anywhere that uh, people could find out more about what you got going on? Yeah, uh, targetwalleye.com. I'm the editor for the Target Walleye emails, and if you can't tell, we like to kind of keep it light and have fun with stuff. So, if you go to targetwalleye.com, you can sign up for free, and uh, you know it's fishing tips and information and news and what's going on, but but there's a fun twist to it. So, if there's if there's any email that I enjoy <laughs> opening in my inbox, it's the Target Walleye emails. Angling buzz is pretty good too. Well, I mean, we're not, we're, not, we're not target walleye level, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. So until next week, you guys keep on sending in your fishing questions, and we will keep answering them.